Johnny Cash was the man in black. Now, most people know this, but not as many people know why he was called Man in Black, why he always dressed in black. He wrote a song called Man in Black in which he tells us. He said, I wear it for the poor. I wear it for the sick, for the lonely, for the old, for the beaten down, for the left behind, for the hopeless, for the voiceless. And he wore it for prisoners. He sings, I wear it for the prisoner who's long paid for his crimes, but he's here because he's a victim of the times. I often wonder how in America we can have this man in black. America is the land of the free. It's the land of opportunity. It's the land of second second chances. How can one man stand out for standing up for these values? I want to try to get you thinking differently today about people who are locked up in America. I want you to see what I think Johnny Cash saw. Usually when I do this talk, I'll use statistics and numbers to talk about why you should care for people that are locked up in America. Over 95% of people are released every year. That's like saying of 100 people that go into prison, 95 of them will be again uh, joining us in the community. I don't know about you, but that alone makes me care what happens to them while they're in prison. This amounts to over 600,000 people per year that are returning to our communities. This is the same as the population of the entire state of Vermont and of the District of Columbia. Of those that return, more than half of them will return to prison within five years. This isn't something to be proud of. Whatever we're doing now, it's currently not working. Lastly, it's incredibly costly. On average, it's about $30,000 per year to incarcerate an individual. As they get older, that price goes up $40,000, $50,000, $60,000 per year. Now, I think these are pretty strong reasons about why you should care about people who are locked up in America. But I also think that sometimes numbers lose their luster. I think stories are are what's most powerful, and so that's what I'm going to focus on today. I also thought it might be helpful to focus on the reasons that we don't care about people who are locked up. So what are the justifications? What are the reasons that allow us to desire the worst for people who are incarcerated? I think the first of these reasons is that crime is a choice. I don't choose crime. I assume you all don't choose crime. So people that do choose to engage in crime should be punished. They should have chose non-crime things like we did. Now, as a criminologist, I know that there's a lot more that goes into crime than simply a choice. But let's assume for a moment that that's it, that it's a choice. So people who choose to engage in crime do make that choice, but their options were much more limited than yours or mine. They grow up in abusive households, surrounded by drugs and addiction. They live in violent neighborhoods. Their schools are ineffective. Their jobs are non-existent. When you grow up in those areas, your options for doing positive things become smaller, smaller, and smaller. And the appeal of crime becomes that much more stronger. Now, the response to this is that people grow up in those neighborhoods, and yet they do not choose crime. There's probably people in this room right now that have grown up in these particular situations, and yet here you are today at a university listening to a talk. That's absolutely true. But imagine a situation in which 10 young men grow up in poverty. Nine of them end up in prison or dead. One of them ends up in college. We shouldn't point to that one and say the other nine should have known better. We should point to that one, but we should tell his story. How was he able to overcome? How was he able to be resilient? The answer to those questions might have helped the other nine. But if crime is a choice, then we should uh, punish those that make that choice so they don't choose that again. Prisons should be nasty. They should be uncomfortable. There are many people that say that prisons are already too nice, that we're already treating people um, too well. You often hear the saying, uh, prisons and jails are three hots and a cot. And so they're three hot meals, and they're a place to sleep at night. Now let me stop for a moment. I've had prison food, and it's rarely hot. Okay. One of the most frustrating moments of my life is when I was doing research in a prison and I had to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for lunch. They give you two slices of white bread, a packet of hard peanut butter, a packet of hard jelly, and a plastic spoon. 
So I took that plastic spoon and I jammed it into this hard peanut butter as best as I could. I was really jammed it in there, finally got a chunk of hard peanut butter out. So I've got a hard chunk of peanut butter on my spoon. I take the back of that spoon and I try and spread it on that bread to make myself a peanut butter and jelly and I just ripped holes all in that bread, just tore it to pieces. Right. So now I've got a pile of torn up bread pieces, a package of hard peanut butter, a package of hard jelly, and this damn plastic spoon. All right. But I was really hungry. I was really hungry. So I just started shoveling pieces of bread into my mouth, start shoveling hard peanut butter into my mouth, and start shoveling hard jelly into my mouth all at the same time. Mmm, peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So it was an embarrassing moment. It was a frustrating moment for me. But it was also a powerful moment. As I looked around, the guys on the inside to my left and right were making the most perfect peanut butter and jelly sandwiches that you ever saw without missing a beat. Something that I took for granted, here they are adapting to it. But back to three hots and a cot. So before this, this talk, I sat down and I tried to think, what were the best moments of my life? What were the times when I was most happiest? From birth until now, the most happiest moments. So I thought of those moments, I put them all together, and I noticed they all had one thing in common. Not one of them involved a cot, right? I don't know what your cot experiences are like, but mine have been not good, right? Cots remind me of my grandmother snoring, okay? <laughs> but let's assume for a moment that the food is at least lukewarm and that the cots are at least somewhat comfy. I want you to think a little bit differently next time you hear this phrase. If three hots and a cot are such a good thing, what was the situation like before that? What is life like that three hots in a cot is a step up? If we allow ourselves to believe that people choose crime and that everybody has the same options and opportunities when they make that choice, then we allow ourselves to desire the worst for the people that are locked up in America. The second reason that I think we allow ourselves to desire the worst for people that are locked up is that we desire the best for their victims. It's only justice to punish those that are guilty. Victims are the innocent ones. They're the ones that we should care about. Now, if you're for victims' rights, surely you're for all victims' rights. And so here again, I want you to think a little bit differently. Those people that are locked up in America, oftentimes they are your victims. Okay? It's very rare for me to talk to somebody in prison and not hear some sort of victimization in their lifetime. They were abused growing up or they witnessed abuse. They've been beaten, they've been robbed, they've been stabbed, they've been shot at, their houses have been broken into, their cars have been broken into. You see, there's a very strong overlap between victims and offenders. The same situations that produce victims are the same ones that produce offenders. So the young boy that's assaulted or abused today, bullied in school, may be the offender of tomorrow. Those who engage in gang violence are often the victims of gang violence. Now, I'm not going to say that there aren't true victims out there, because there certainly are. Before this talk, I tried to imagine to myself, who would be the most difficult person to convince that they should care about people who are locked up in America? I believe the answer to that is a mother whose child has been murdered. Now, this is a tough one. But I believe that mother's story is the most important story of all. How she responds to that deeply affects all of us. And I don't know that it's right to assume that she would desire the worst for that particular offender. She might recognize that that offender has a family too. She might recognize that punishing that offender is not going to bring her child back. And although it's no excuse, she might recognize that that offender was a victim at one point in his life as well. If we allow ourselves to create two groups, victims and offenders, them and us, then we allow ourselves to desire the worst for people that are locked up in America. Now lastly, we might desire long and harsh prison sentences simply because we think it keeps us safe. If people are locked up, then they can't engage in crime again. There's two points that I want to make here. First, there's been a lot of talk about releasing non-violent offenders uh, early from prison. It's thought that they represent the best risk, they're not going to re-offend, that our safety will be uh, in the best hands. Well, as it turns out, violent offenders are actually less likely to reoffend. Typically, people engage in violence for situational reasons. 
often done out of emotions, not necessarily out of need or an addiction. So they're actually less likely to reoffend. Second, and perhaps most importantly, for various reasons, as people age, as offenders grow older, they grow out of crime, usually by age 30, and most all of them by age 40. So when we start locking people up that are 30, 40, 50, 60, and yes, 70, 80 years old, we're not doing a whole lot for our safety at that point anymore. So when we think about these different reasons about why we desire the worst for people that are locked up in America, they might not be as strong as we originally thought. But I told you today that I was going to talk about stories, and then I thought stories were the most uh, powerful. So here's a story that summarizes those last three points that I just made. About a year ago, we were doing uh, research in prisons in here in Arizona, and we were interviewing inmates and talking to them about their visitation experiences. So who comes to visit you? What do you talk about? That kind of thing. So I'm talking to this one guy, and it becomes pretty clear uh, very early on that we're not going to be talking about visitation, that he's been thinking about his life for some time, and that he wants somebody to talk to. So he told me when he was young that he was good. I used to be so good, he said. And then he was sexually assaulted twice. He grew very angry when he was talking to me about this. His language is a little bit more colorful than mine. But he said, forget that. I'm never going to let anyone mess with me like that again. And then he got real quiet again. He said he had difficulty remembering things when he was growing up. He had trouble reading and writing in school. He still can't read or write. And then with tears in his eyes, he looked at me and said, I couldn't understand. Why would they make fun of me instead of helping? So he turned to drugs and alcohol. He said he became one of the most feared people out on the streets. I was an animal, he said. And then his little brother died. This devastated him. He said his little brother was perfect, and his little brother had never done anything wrong in his life. And if this could happen to his little brother, then he didn't understand the world. He was devastated. He's still devastated. This man didn't choose to be sexually assaulted. He didn't choose to be bullied at school. He did choose to be an animal on the streets, but what other choice did he have? This man was 47 years old. When I looked into his eyes, I didn't see anger. I didn't see violence. I didn't see somebody to be feared. I saw what Johnny Cash probably saw, hopelessness, despair, defeat. This man was released from prison a month ago. Folks, these are your people that are locked up in America. These are their stories. But these aren't the stories that you usually hear. So when I teach at ASU, before my lecture, I typically go out and uh, look at the local news headlines. I believe it's very important for our students to apply what they're learning to the world around them. And so one day before class, I checked out the local news headlines, and this is what I saw. Wildcat family sculpture vandalized at U of A. Former NFL player found guilty of tax fraud. Fight between two workers leaves one dead. Two bleed not guilty and boxers beating death. Man pleads not guilty in hit and run. Juror parole narrows in Arizona temple killings. Four puppies found in a bin covered in fuel. Man changes plea in wife strangulation. This was the local news. This wasn't the local crime news. This was the local news. I didn't change any of this up here. You often hear that if it bleeds, it leads. Why are we so obsessed with crime and violence and murder? I think part of the reason we like those stories is because they make us feel better about ourselves. It allows us to say, that's not me. I might be a lousy teacher, but at least I'm not a killer. In short, it allows us to feel better about ourselves at the expense of other people. I don't know about you, but I'm sick of these stories. I'm sick of reading them. I'm sick of seeing them. So what I'm asking you today is to tell, retell, and share the positive stories in your life. And I know you want to do this. I know you want to do this. You know how I know you want to do this? Because you love stories of unlikely animal friends. (laughs) A baby owl, a baby fox that should be mortal enemies. Here they are frolicking in the snow together. You love that. You see that. It makes you happy. right? You love that story. 
And you love stories of returning service men and women coming home to surprise their family. It makes you feel good. It makes you cry. It makes you happy. And I know you love this story of an inmate who helped a child with Asperger's syndrome. When no one else could reach this child, this inmate could. And so this child's parents were at their wit's end. The child was no longer hugging them, no longer showing affection. They didn't know what to do. They didn't have the $20,000 that it would take to have a service dog work with their son. And so they reached out to this inmate in this program in the correctional system. The inmate, his name is Christopher, by the way, trained this dog. He would mimic the symptoms of Asperger's syndrome to train this dog before he let the boy have it. Now the boy hugs everyone, his parents and Christopher. I know you love these stories. So why aren't these stories told more often? I have this assignment that I give to students. All right, this time of year, every professor around the country has the exact same experience. Professors come up to them, and, or students come up to them and say, what can I do for extra credit? I'll do anything. I'll write another paper, they say. I'll do anything, whatever you want. So I said, fine, here's an assignment. Go out and find an article that paints an ex-offender in a positive light. Write a paragraph about your thoughts and attach that article. That's it, they say. That's it. Go do it. Three things happen. The first is I get an email. I can't find anything. I've looked really hard. Right? Then they try and stretch it. Well, President Obama admitted that he used drugs. He's kind of successful. Does that work? <laughs> no, it doesn't work. Go look harder. The second thing is that when they do find an article, they all find the same article. They find the article, right? And I've done some checking. It's not like they're sharing their work or anything like that. It's just they're finding the same article. And then the third thing, this article is in some obscure, random, underground news outlet in some random city, okay? These stories just aren't told. So what are the stories that we should be telling? It's a story of inmates in Arizona who have donated hundreds of thousands of dollars to the Special Olympics. It's a story of an ex-offender who found a job, overcame the odds, not only that, but created and owns her own business now. It's your story about how you overcame victimization or living in poverty to be in this room here today. Now, you might think that my story doesn't matter, that stories can't be powerful, but I disagree. Oftentimes, our legislation is based on one story, usually a bad one. Someone is released from prison, they murder someone, and then the 600,000 other people that are released from prison are affected by the harsh policy that follows. So why can't we do the same thing with one positive story? Why can't one positive ex-offender story affect all the other 600,000 in a good way? Hell, even the man in black could get in on this one. At Arizona State University, we're proud to say that we measure ourselves by whom we include and not by whom we exclude. Well, right now in America, we're excluding hundreds of thousands of men and women who are locked up behind bars. We're excluding millions more who have criminal records. I believe that if we change the way that we talk about these men and women, then we'll change the way that we treat them. There's been a lot of talk recently about criminal justice reform. President Obama visited a prison. Pope Francis sat and talked with inmates. I often think to myself, how do we keep this going? How do we make sure that this isn't just a political thing? I don't think the answer lies with criminologists. I don't think it lies with legislators. I don't think it lies with President Obama or Pope Francis. I think it lies with you. And you, and you, and you, and me, and victims, and offenders, and their families, all of us. Now, we don't all have to wear black, but I believe if we work together, we can make a few more things right. So, what story are you going to tell? Thank you. <laughs>